If I had to give one reason for Batman's enduring appeal since his debut in Detective Comics issue 27 in 1939, I'd say it's the character's versatility. From campy, colourful and comedic, to grim, gritty and grounded. Ah, Batman's a fascist now, or whatever. With every new version of Batman, every new cartoon, movie, video game, the Dark Knight gets pushed in fresh and exciting directions. But which adaptation is the best? Well, that's obviously an impossible question to answer. So instead, I'm just going to talk about some of my favourites. And heads up, this video is heavily weighted by nostalgia. All of my videos are, so I don't know why you'd be surprised at this point. And yet, I still get comments all the time saying things like, Your bias is showing! As if unbiased art criticism is a thing that either could or should exist. But look, you know the score, you're smart people, that's why you watch my videos. So without further yapping, hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and here's just a bunch of Batmans that I like. Number 10, The Batman. Kicking things off with 2022's The Batman, a movie that I absolutely loved, with a few caveats. Directed by Matt Reeves and starring Robert Pattinson as the caped crusader, this adaptation walks the line between brutal, almost uncomfortable realism and super stylized cinematography and big operatic action. And I've got to tell you man, when I sat there in the cinema watching this for the first time and I saw a rain-covered Gotham on Halloween night, the city's criminals gripped with paranoia, squinting at every shadow and Robert Pattinson's narration, Fear is a tool. I thought to myself, holy crap, this is the best movie I've ever seen. I'm seeing Batman on screen for what feels like the first time. This is it, this is everything I've ever wanted. And then the movie kept going, <laughs> for about three hours, becoming incredibly bloated, completely losing the plot a few times, before eventually finding its groove again for the final moments. So let me explain. One of the great strengths of the Batman, when it's firing on all cylinders, is the small-scale cat and mouse chase between the Dark Knight and Paul Dano's perfectly executed Zodiac Killer-inspired Riddler. But when it loses sight of that, in favour of a needless detour through the whitewashed legacy of the Wayne family, some hand-waving in the general direction of right-wing internet extremism, before settling in the CGI sludge of a mid-2000s disaster movie, I can't help but wonder, did nobody at Warner Brothers stop to ask, does this superhero movie really need to be three hours long? There's a version of this film that I could see being not just the best Batman adaptation, but one of the best comic book adaptations. You lose the half-cocked Wayne and Falcone history lesson, as well as the revelation that Carmine Falcone is Selina Cow's father. Yes, I know that's a thing in the comics, but in the context of this movie, it just gets flopped onto the table way too late and doesn't really go anywhere. You can absolutely cut the Barry Keoghan Joker appearance. My god, we do not need another cringy incel Joker. One was quite enough, thank you. And then you just get back to Batman, coming up against his intellectual equal, Edward Nigma, who ultimately holds the mirror up to our hero and says, we're not so different, you and I. You know, my favorite thing about this movie is Robert Pattinson's nuanced take on Bruce Wayne and his night-dwelling alter ego. I wasn't one of the many naysayers who only knew the actor as sparkly Dracula for Tumblr Girls. I'd been blown away by Pattinson's intense performance in the Safdie Brothers film Good Time just a few years earlier, so I knew he had the chops. But even then, I couldn't have predicted that Robert Pattinson would deliver my favorite live-action Batman performance. He has so much presence in this film, even when he's just standing there doing nothing. In fact, especially when he's just standing there doing nothing, his white eyes peering out from beneath that hand-stitched leather cowl. I love the Batman's visual design, cinematographer Greg Fraser's use of vintage and unconventional lenses for a claustrophobic and surreal look. The use of Liverpool as a stand-in for Gotham City is honestly inspired. It's a city I'm quite familiar with, and with its Victorian architecture and its own steely working-class heritage, this film has redefined how I see Gotham. And ultimately, I do think it sticks the landing, with Batman stepping out of the shadows to become a literal beacon for the people of Gotham. The movie opens with fear and ends with hope, reflecting the full gamut of Batman as a character. So I hope I haven't dogged on this movie too much, it's 100% worthy of being on this list, but it's too much of a mixed bag for it to be any higher than number 10. Number 9, Batman the Video Game. When we think about comic book adaptations, we might gravitate towards movies, TV shows and cartoons, but Batman has had a rich history in video games. And for my money, one of the best Batman games ever made is 1990's Batman the Video Game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Developed by Sunsoft, this action platformer allows you to take control of the now iconic purple palleted Gotham Guardian while punching, bataranging and wall jumping your way to victory. 
For me, when I think about Batman the video game, a few things come to mind. The amazingly responsive controls that have aged like few other games from this era, the verticality of the level design and the satisfaction of climbing seemingly endless bell towers, and then the pixel-perfect platforming, which is so tight it gives a certain Italian plumber a run for his money. I used to talk about this game all the time back when I was more of a video games channel, because it has long been my favourite pick up and play game when I have half an hour to kill. Waiting for my wife to get ready before we go out for dinner, I'll just see how far into Batman I can get. Nah, I'm just kidding, she's usually the one waiting for me to get ready. Plus, go out for dinner? In this economy? Story-wise, Batman the video game is not much to write home about. It's a pretty loose adaptation of the 1989 movie, retaining only the essential beats, locations and set pieces. But then it pulls in villains from the comics as well. I mean, kind of. A lot of them are in name only. I think what probably happened is whoever wrote the manual for this game grabbed a copy of Who's Who in the DC Universe, looked up a load of Batman villains, and just played Eeny Meeny Miny Mo. So while not necessarily a very deep exploration of the Batman mythos, the quality of this game shines as a bright spot in the NES library, and as the best Batman game for almost 20 years. But more on that later. Number 8. The Lego Batman Movie I saw the Lego Batman movie back in 2017, when it first released, and I thought it was… fine. A well-animated family film with enough heart, humour and non-stop needle drops to hold even an iPad kid's attention long enough for them to add a Lego Batmobile to their Christmas list. But then, in the intervening years, I would see adult Batman fans regularly rank this amongst the best of the Caped Crusaders cinematic offerings, and I'd think, come on now, really? But like, for real? That is until just last year when I finally decided to give it another watch, and I was shocked to find out that, <laughs> no, I'm the idiot and it really is that good. I've got to chalk this one up to user error on my part. I, I think I went in originally expecting a Batman movie, when what I should have been expecting was a Lego Batman movie. That sounds kind of stupid and obvious, but watching this film for the second time, I reminded myself that this isn't just the character of Batman with a superficial Lego veneer over the top, it is literally the 4cm tall toy version of Batman, whose adventures are presumably determined by the imagination of a child. Yes, this is a child's idea of what Batman is. Being thrown across the room at the Joker and mashed into the carpet, stopping only briefly to let out a corny one-liner. His unwarranted confidence and comically macho voice delivered brilliantly by actor Will Arnett. So this is a very specific interpretation of Batman, which goes back to what I was saying in the intro. This is a version of the Dark Knight unlike any other we've seen before. But that doesn't stop the movie from being jam-packed with nods and references to Batman's comic, film and cartoon history. It's really a Bat fan's dream to pick through all of these sometimes quite obscure comic book easter eggs and characters. While at the core of it all is a story with real depth about an emotionally stunted man who is the paradigm of, dare I say it, toxic masculinity, <laughs> learning that no man is an island and it's okay to let people in. And if that, combined with gags about robbing the boy wonders, inappropriately short shorts, doesn't give you the warm and fuzzies, I don't know what will. Number 7. Batman on Star Commercials And it's at this point, dear viewer, that you might be thinking that this list has gone <laughs> completely off the rails. But buckle up, because I'm about to talk about a random car commercial from the early 2000s for at least a few minutes. OnStar, a subsidiary of General Motors, is an in-car support system that can do things like call for emergency help if you get in a car crash, find your vehicle if it's stolen, and offer remote diagnostics on your car's health. I mean, I say it is. <laughs> I imagine smartphones have rendered all of OnStar's services obsolete. But maybe I'm wrong, and if I am, I'm sorry, OnStar. I'm just a dumb, limey Brit anyway. What do I know? Except how to drive a manual. <laughs> but what does all this have to do with Batman? Well, at the turn of the millennium, OnStar turned to ad agency Campbell Ewald, who in turn hired legit film directors Andrew Davis and Vincent Ward to produce a series of commercials starring the world's greatest detective, but also the world's guiltiest man of vehicular homicide. Airing from 2000 to 2002, these commercials starred Bruce Thomas as Batman in a series of mini-adventures designed to show that if Batman uses OnStar in his Batmobile, maybe you should use it in your 1994 Ford Taurus. The six commercials are kind of a hodgepodge of different elements from the Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher Batman movies. You have the Burton Batmobile and the Danny Elfman score, but the suit was pieced together from parts of stunt costumes from 1997's Batman and Robin, bat nipples and all, with a repainted yellow chest emblem to more closely resemble Michael Keaton's suit. Michael Goff returns as Alfred, and they even reuse some footage from the various Burton and Schumacher movies. But all of this is combined with much more comic book accurate villains, including the Joker, the Penguin, and the Riddler. 
So with one foot in the world of the movies and one foot in the comics, these OnStar commercials have gained kind of a cult status as curiosities in Batman's on-screen history, ostensibly taking place in their own distinct continuity. And thanks to the fact that they were shot on the Warner Brothers studio lot, utilising a lot of the same sets as the movies, these commercials look undeniably high budget. Look, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that OnStar's Batman has hidden depth or cuts to the core of the character or anything like that. They're just cool little pieces of ephemera, from a time period in which Batman was basically my religion. So seeing the character in live action in any capacity would have been legitimately thrilling. Number 6. Batman 66 My experience with the 1966 Batman TV show and companion movie starring Adam West is, I would imagine, fairly universal for Batman fans of my generation. That is, I saw the odd episode and the movie here and there when it was rerun on TV, and it was just another Batman thing for me to enjoy, without much discernment. But then, as I got a bit older, and my idea of Batman had been defined by the 90s animated series, and the Burton movies, and the comics, I started to reject Adam West's campy incarnation of the Caped Crusader. I mean, Batman is supposed to be serious, not doing the bat 2 c and dishing out oceanic repellent bat spray against explosive sharks. But then when I got a bit older still, in my late 20s and now in my early 30s, and especially as we get pummeled with more and more grim and gritty adaptations of The Dark Knight, I realised that it's good and cool actually when Batman is fun. And as an adaptation of the Silver Age silliness of Batman comics at the time, the 66 TV show is surprisingly faithful. It's impossible to resist the charm of Adam West lounge lizard Bruce Wayne with his syrupy voice and winking one-liners. And the extremely affable Burt Ward as Robin, who plays off West perfectly as this slightly gormless sidekick. There is a self-awareness to this show that it took me years to understand. You can't roll your eyes at something that is taking the piss out of itself. And then of course there is the music, the onomatopoeic sound effects, the technical sets and costumes, the iconic gadgets, and that Batmobile for crying out loud. All of these elements have transcended time to become ingrained in the public perception of Batman even to this day. But if you've ever wanted to have your very own 1966 Batmobile, this video is brought to you by Fanhome, the leader in subscription-based collections and models. Embark on your journey of putting together one of the most famous cars in history with the 1966 Batmobile build-up model subscription. Each month you'll receive the parts you need to build this 1.8 scale, die-cast metal and ABS replica. Fanhome sent me the first two shipments of Batmobile parts and I'm blown away by the size and the detail of this thing. Look at that tiny little bat phone, it's so cute! And if you're a big Batman nerd like me, you'll get a kick out of the special full colour magazines that accompany each month's components. In there we've got a show by show guide to all 120 episodes of the 1966 Batman TV series, a year by year history of the Dark Knight himself, plus reviews of some of the most iconic Batman comics and graphic novels. I love that! So to find out more and get started with your very own 1966 Batmobile, use the link in the description of this video. Number 5. Kenner's Legends of Batman This might be a bit of a weird pull, but hey, <laughs> I've already included a 2000s commercial for a virtual car assistant, so all bets are off. And the fact is that Kenner's Legends of Batman action figures were instrumental in defining what Batman was for me as a kid, and also what he could be. This toy line ran from 1994 to 1997, and spotlighted alternate history versions of the world's greatest detective and his supporting cast, from past, present and future. We're talking Samurai Batman, Viking Batman, Cyborg Batman, Sewer Surfing Batman, Batman with Hat, and Inverted Costume Batman, where just his mouth and chin are covered, but the rest of him is completely naked. And look, only some of those were made up. 1994 to 1997 was like prime first exposure to Batman time for me, and these figures really captured my young imagination. Not only did this line first introduce me to members of the Bat family who hadn't yet made it out of the comics and onto the screen, such as Azrael and Nightwing, but it was also my first exposure to the Elseworlds concept of DC Comics. And as I got older and I got seriously into comics, I would always gravitate towards those Elseworlds stories, perhaps because of Legends of Batman. Number 4. Batman The Audio Adventures Batman The Audio Adventures is a comedy drama podcast modelled after the campy radio plays of yesteryear. Debuting in 2021, the show is now two series deep, and is intended as an homage to both the 1966 Batman TV series and 1992's Batman the Animated Series. And if that sounds like a killer combo worthy of the Caped Crusader himself, well let me just say that this podcast pulls it off flawlessly. 
Written and directed by Saturday Night Live writer Dennis McNicholas, Batman The Audio Adventures features an absolutely stacked cast of recognisable voice talent. Jeffrey Wright, the Batman's own Jim Gordon, offers his distinctive baritone here as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, alongside screen actors including Rosario Dawson, Brooke Shields, Alan Tudyk, Jason Sudeikis, Seth Meyers, and a host of other SNL alums. But the standouts for me are Brent Spiner as the Joker, Gillian Jacobs as Harley Quinn, and John Leguizamo as the Riddler, who all provide character-defining performances in my opinion. These are now the voices of these characters in my head. I go so far as to say that I prefer Brent Spiner's Joker to a certain ex-Jedi, and I know that that's going to be sacrilegious to some. So great performances, great music and sound design, and a really engaging story that weaves all throughout Gotham, bringing together all of Batman's rogues for a gripping climax. If nothing else, I'm really hoping this video can introduce a few more people to Batman The Audio Adventures, because I don't see many people talking about it, and it's honestly one of my favourite Batman anythings in recent memory. Number 3. The Batman Arkham Franchise As a game, 2009's Batman Arkham Asylum set a new standard for licensed superhero titles, breaking a multi-generational curse of mediocre movie titans. Then, in 2011, its sequel, Arkham City, took the Batman experience to new heights, literally, as it traded the Metroidvania-style map for an open-world portion of Gotham. But as a Batman adaptation, the Arkham series' strength lies in its world-building, its propulsive storytelling, and the performances of its voice cast. Now, I'm particularly focusing on the first two games in the series here, mostly because it was diminishing returns after that, let's face it, but also because the fan response to the canonical end of this version of Batman is something I'd really rather not wade into right now. Developed by Rocksteady Studios, these games are a love letter to all things Batman, adapting different elements from various comics and films. But they are especially indebted to 1992's Batman the Animated Series. In fact, one of the show's creators, Paul Dini, wrote the storylines for Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, while Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill reprised their roles from the cartoon as Batman and the Joker, respectively. So for me, as a young adult when these games hit, it was very appealing to have what I saw as the maturation of the Batman cartoon that I'd loved so much as a kid. And I don't necessarily feel that way now. In fact, I'd say that there are some things in these games that, in hindsight, <laughs> seem more juvenile than the cartoon, some very epic gamer moments. But anyway, like a lot of the other successful adaptations on this list, the Arkham series retains all of the fantasy, the science fiction, and the super heroics, but grounds it all in a gritty aesthetic. This is a very bleak version of Batman's world. But that's not to say that there isn't some judicious use of stylization, for example in the character and costume designs. I really love that original suit from Arkham Asylum, which got a few tweaks in Arkham City before turning into a bit of a carbon fibre armoured mess in the later games. To me, this is a big muscle-bound Jim Lee style Batman, but with enough concessions to realism, like the big boots and the armoured undersuit, that you can believe this version of Batman could exist in this more realistic universe. And Rocksteady also understood that Longyear's Batman is the best Batman. Size does matter, fellas, at least when it comes to those big 90s style bat ears. I mentioned the propulsive storytelling a moment ago, and that's one thing I really love about the Arkham series. Each game takes place across one night, and you as Batman just get dropped in the middle of a situation that just doesn't let up. You go from set piece to set piece, fight to fight, from one iconic Batman villain to another. And it all ramps up to either a big ridiculous final boss, or a genuinely dramatic conclusion. And I haven't even mentioned the free flow combat, a gameplay style that I devoted so many hundreds of hours of my life to mastering that is now hardwired into my DNA, second only to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. The Arkham series meditative loop of attack, dodge, counter has been often imitated, but never bettered, not even by a certain wall crawler. Number two, the Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher Batman movies. In 1989, Tim Burton's Batman pushed The Dark Knight further into the mainstream than ever before. There were t-shirts, posters, cereal, toys and video games, but beneath all of that was just a really solid late 80s action movie. Obviously, I think these movies are now best remembered for that distinctive, ooky spooky Tim Burton aesthetic, but whenever I go back and rewatch that first Batman film, it's always surprising to me how straightforward it is, how tight and fast paced it is. It's just a good old fashioned swashbuckling adventure. But then in 1992, we got Batman Returns, and that's when the Tim Burton style gets turned up to 11. This is a crazy movie, man. <laughs> 
There's something legitimately transgressive about seeing your childhood favourite superhero in amongst all this BDSM gear and filthy circus clowns and Danny DeVito spewing up black bile. I was seriously freaked out by this movie as a kid. And the calibre of actors on display in these two films is astonishing. Michael Keaton, Jack Nicholson, Danny DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer, and they're all playing these larger than life characters and elevating the work beyond just a simple comic book caper. But then I would also include the two Joel Schumacher directed movies, 1995's Batman Forever and 1997's Batman and Robin. Because as a kid in the 90s, the way these movies were always packaged and presented was as one universe, as one franchise. And certainly there are things that tie them together as a single continuity. Joel Schumacher took the foundations of what Tim Burton had done, but leaned more into that campy Silver Age Batman, more akin to the 1966 TV show. And I love each of these four movies, for different reasons, honestly. I really enjoy Michael Keaton's version of Bruce Wayne. The actor uses his comedy chops to bring a type of wit and suavity that we don't always get to see in the character. I love how Batman Returns is just a totally unhinged auteur movie. It's unmistakably a Tim Burton joint, and that kind of authorial voice doesn't always come across in big budget superhero films. I like how Batman Forever attempts to explore Bruce Wayne's psyche a little bit more. For all of the neon lights and bat nipples that Joel Schumacher brought to the franchise, I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for really understanding the character. And I do love Arnold Schwarzenegger and Uma Thurman just camping it up like a couple of Power Rangers villains in Batman and Robin. It was very appealing to me in 1997, and it's just as appealing to me now in 2024. Number 1. Batman The Animated Series Now there's a strong argument to be made that Batman The Animated Series, which ran from 1992 to 1995, before being renamed The New Batman Adventures from 1997 to 1999, is the best comic book adaptation, period. Not just Batman. How do you take 50 plus years of a character's comic book history, boil it down to its essential elements, and give it an aesthetic that is completely its own, without getting lost in the shadow of its big screen contemporary? That was the question that creators Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski, as well as producers Paul Dini, Alan Burnett, and a host of other writers set out to answer. Batman the Animated Series took the world's greatest detective back to his pulpy noir roots, with a visual style informed by the theatrical Superman cartoons produced by Fleischer Studios in the 1940s. This is very much a street-level Batman, taking on old-fashioned thugs and gangsters in a deco-inspired Gotham City. But that didn't mean completely eschewing the gothic and fantastical elements of the Tim Burton movies and the comics. The show coupled early 20th century designs with supernatural themes and characters, which, when infused with Bruce Timm's distinctive angular character designs, helped define not only this version of Batman, but every version of The Dark Knight going forward. And then of course there is the voice cast. Batman's producers opted not to use the usual suspects of Saturday morning cartoon voice actors, instead bringing in stage and screen actors such as Mark Hamill as the Joker, Arlene Sorkin as the original character Harley Quinn, and of course the late, great Kevin Conroy, as the titular, bat-eared, bad guy beater-upper. If you ask most fans what Batman sounds like, what voice they hear in their head when they read the comics, I would guess that the majority of them would say Kevin Conroy. It is truly one of the most iconic, character-defining performances of all time. Conroy, Hamill, and a supporting cast full of known screen actors bring a sense of gravitas and prestige to this already big-budget, high-quality animated series. And this all speaks to a level of respect for its audience that was virtually unheard of in kids' cartoons at the time. Rewatching the series over the years, I'm always struck by its slow pace and restrained use of dialogue. There are often long sequences in which Batman silently investigates a warehouse, as that incredible score swells to a triumphant crescendo. The show is so effective in creating atmosphere, in its tone setting, and it does it all with a level of confidence that is still impressive 30 plus years later. Even more impressive, in fact, in today's era of retention editing and just constant stimulation all the time. Can't let anybody scroll past. Gotta hit them right in the dopamine receptors. But above all else, the series creators understood the full breadth of Batman's characters. He's funny when he wants to be, terrifying when he needs to be, earnest and optimistic when it matters most. And that's why the best Batman adaptation is the OnStar Batman commercials. No, I'm just kidding. It's obviously Batman the Animated Series. The 90s were a tumultuous time for Batman in the comics. He got his back broken by Bane, he had his first encounters with Harley Quinn, and his best super friend got punched to death in the street. But if you want to find out why those were some of the most important comics of the 90s, you'll have to click the video on screen now. I'll see you over there.